Do you want to see a magic trick? Yes. Yeah. I should learn one. That would be a great way to kick off a talk. <laughs> so I'm here to talk to you um, about metaphors and about the way we think and the way that language shapes the way that we think. In my brilliant talk title, Metaphors Are Similes, Similes Are Like Metaphors. English major. Any other English majors? OK. A couple. My mic's on. Yeah. OK. There you go. How about now? Thank yes, you. there I am. Thank you. So I want to start by asking, who are we? As software developers, um, I prefer the term software developer. Depending on the company you work for, you might have a different kind of title. Um, and I think it's really interesting that we can't agree on what to call ourselves. Are we architects? An architect is someone who plans, designs, and reviews the construction of buildings without ever touching a tool. There used to be a role for architects in software development, but those are largely now enterprise roles, and I think they're going away the dinosaur. So we're not really architects. Are we scientists? Scientists engage in systematic activity to acquire knowledge. They follow the scientific method of formulating and validating hypotheses. And outside of some A-B testing, maybe for some front-end work, I've never come up with a hypothesis for the way my code should work and gone and tested it. So I don't feel like a scientist. Are we engineers? Software engineer sounds great, right? The foundational education of an engineer is four to six years of university experience in an engineering discipline, followed by a subsequent four to six years of practice culminating in a major project that is then peer reviewed. At the end of that, you get to call yourself an engineer. We're not engineers. <laughs> Are we artisans? An artisan is a skilled craft worker who makes or creates things by hand. Artisans practice a craft and may, through experience and aptitude, eventually reach a level of artistry. There is the software craftsmanship movement, which would encourage us to call ourselves craftspeople, but I don't think that's a perfect fit either. Are we cowboys? <laughs> We've all heard of cowboy coders, people who work independently and make really terrible things happen to code. <laughs> Hopefully there are no cowboy coders in the audience. The opposite of a cowboy coder is the architecture astronaut. So are we astronauts? Hopefully we're not over-engineering the things that we do. So hopefully we're not astronauts. Maybe we should call ourselves firefighting space cowboys and just be done with that. <laughs> and we like cat gifts. <laughs> so why does it matter what we call ourselves? Does, does the language that we use matter at all? I want to take a look um, at the beginning at linguistic theory to help us explore how the way that we think um, is influenced by the language that we use. <clears throat> this gentleman is Benjamin Worf. Um, you can tell he's old because you can see pixelation on him. <laughs> um, in 1956, Benjamin Worf asked the question of whether or not language shapes the way we think and see the world. His experiments culminated in what's called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis of linguistic relativity, which states that, yes, language and linguistic categories do influence thought. His experiments dealt with descriptions of objects and languages with um, grammatical genders, um, mainly German and Spanish, both of which have gendered nouns. And in his experiments, subjects were shown a variety of common items and asked to describe them. La clere in Spanish is the key, and it's a feminine noun. When shown a picture of a key and asked to describe it, Spanish speakers use words like intricate and lovely. In German, the word for key is der Schlüssel, which is a masculine word. The German speakers tend to describe the material of the key rather than the form. They use words like heavy and jagged and rough. By the adjectives they used, you'd think the German speakers were looking at a completely different key than the Spanish speakers. My favorite example is this, Le Vaduc de Malo, and I'm probably butchering that pronunciation. It was built in 2004. It's the tallest bridge in the world. One of those masts is over 1,100 feet above the base of the bridge. 
It's ranked as one of the greatest engineering achievements of all time, and it spans a valley on the road from France to Spain. In French, the word for bridge is le pont. Um, someone did an analysis of the words, the language that was used to describe this incredible bridge in different um, countries and newspapers. And in French newspapers, French journalists use words like gigantic to describe the bridge, emphasizing its mass and its strength. They even called it a monster of concrete. The German word for bridge, de Brucha, is feminine. And German journalists use very different language. German newspapers described the bridge as elegant, as weightless, and even the poetic, it floats above the clouds. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about analogies and analogical thinking, so I want to establish some basic terms before we get too far along. An analogy is a comparison between two things on the basis of structure and for the purpose of explanation or clarification. If you've ever taken a standardized intelligence test, you're probably familiar with this. A is to B as C is to D. So as an example, Bundler is to Ruby as NPM is to JavaScript. Analogies take two primary forms, metaphors and similes. Metaphors are declarative. No man is an island. Similes make comparisons. It is like a poke in the eye. We map new experiences and draw on past experiences to determine what to do in a novel situation. We make analogies. I recently read this amazing book, Surfaces and Essences, by Douglas Hofstadter, best known for Gödel, Escher, and Bach. He co-wrote it with a French psychologist named Emmanuel Sander, and it puts forward a fundamental and unique perspective on the nature of thought. The core premise is that analogy is the fuel and fire of thinking. But we have well-defined mental categories for things, be they situations, types of people, kinds of food, and we draw on these analogies to predict outcomes or to understand a new circumstance. We make analogies of situations when something reminds us of something else or when we're demonstrating empathy. We say, situation X reminds me of situation Y that I have experienced. We're constantly faced with unknown situations and our brain's job is to make sense of an unpredictable swarming chaos of stimuli. How does it do this? The ceaseless sale of input triggers analogies, helping us to pinpoint the essence of what is going on. Often this means a spontaneous evocation of words or idioms or the triggering of nameless, long forgotten memories. Without categorization and analogy making between these categories, we would be paralyzed by new situations, overwhelmed by sensory data, and unable to reason about the world around us. Categorization and analogies are how we make inquiries into the nature of reality itself. In Hofstadter's book, he talks about the two kinds of categories that we make, and he calls them marked and unmarked categories. As an example, the marked category of rock, um, rock one, has a definition, a piece of solid mineral material. But that's not the only use of the word rock, right? We might say, he is a rock, and we don't mean that literally, he is a rock. So we have this unmarked definition of rock, which means something solid. Similarly, consider the word ladder. Um, we can define it as a series of bars between up two uprights used for climbing up or down something. There's this uh, South African phrase, a fool is a wise man's ladder. And of course, we don't literally mean that a wise man climbs a ladder of fools. You can tell the fools are, they're wearing ties. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's an unmarked definition of ladder, which is ascending stages by which someone may progress or advance. Consider a mother who has a nine-year-old child um, who walks herself to school every day. And the mother might say to the child, watch out for cars when you cross the street. The marked definition of a car is a four-wheeled vehicle used to transport people on a road, and the word car calls this to mind. But when the girl hears her mother's admonition, she's actually going to be thinking about the, luckily, the unmarked definition of car, which is any vehicle that moves along the road. If she didn't have this unmarked definition in her mind, she would watch out for a sedan and walk straight in front of a steamroller. Bad outcome. Don't recommend it. Um, 
So analogies are really core to the way we think and the way we understand um, things and the way we communicate with each other, and we develop analogical vocabularies. I want to consider, and as programmers, we deal with categories of things all day long, like strings. Um, strings are common in most programming languages, and we all know what someone means when they say a string. But how did this come to mean that? I took a look at the literature. Um, this is one of the earliest uses of the word string in terms of programming languages. From 1958, a paper called A Programming Language for Mechanical Translation. Each continuous string of letters between punctuation marks or spaces is looked up in a dictionary. Now, this isn't the use of string in its modern day sense. The data structure that is being referred to in this paper is actually a line which has continuations. Um, so the, the the string is a metaphor indicating that the letters in question are connected and form a continuous line, sort of like a birthday banner. The next instance I could find, find was in a paper called Syntactic and Semantic Augments to Algol. The purpose of this paper is to propose a set of syntactic and semantic augments designed to facilitate the description of string manipulation in that language. Note that string is in quotes. This is an obvious sign that the author was performing an analogical mapping between an existing and known concept, things strung together, and a new concept, a series of symbols that are strung together. Finally, there's this quote from the Commit System for Mechanical Translation, and I'm not going to read that, but this is more akin to the way we use it today. In this case, talking about string standing alone as a concept, and it even has a special symbol assigned to it, a dollar sign, which is still common in a lot of languages to signify a string variable. The creation of the string metaphor opened the door to similar metaphors. For example, ropes. A rope is a binary tree with leaf nodes that contain a short string. Each node has a weight equal to the length of its string plus the sum of leaf, no leaf nodes weight in the left subtree. The right subtree stores the second part and its weight is the sum of the left child's weight and the length of its contained string. Why do we care about ropes? If you use a text editor, um, a text editor may use ropes to represent text being edited so that operations such as insertion and deletion and random access can be done very efficiently. So the initial analogical mapping of string to characters carries on as rope to strings. Every concept in programming is a metaphor that someone created based on mapping a new concept onto an existing semantic category. So um, this categorization can lead to creating new ideas, but they can also constrain our thinking. This is Lyra Bordowski. She's professor of cognitive science at the University of California in San Diego. She studies the interactions between language cognition and perception, and she ran a really interesting experiment. The Russian language has more commonly known and commonly used words to describe color variations than English does. Um, this color in Russian is Golubboy, and this one is Sine. In Borodowski's experiment, subjects were shown cards with a colored square at the top and asked which of the colors on their cards, the card on the right, matched it most closely. Russian speakers were significantly faster at identifying these color variations than their English-speaking counterparts. Their richer vocabulary for color variations enabled them to perform this task much more quickly. The categories embedded in their language had a measurable cognitive effect. So what happens when we don't have words for something, like not having words for color variations? So how many, of this, how many of you have this happened to? You're at maybe a Thanksgiving dinner. You've just, everyone's been served dessert. You've had your dessert. You think there might be room for a little bit more. And there's one piece of pie left on the table. And nobody wants to take that last piece of pie because they're afraid that either someone else wants it or they're going to appear really greedy. So we might describe that in English as that last piece of pie that everyone wants, but no one is brave enough to just go ahead and say they want for a peer, fear of appearing greedy. Word soup. We have to struggle to communicate this concept. Um, in Spanish, there's a word for this, la vergüenza, which means the shame. <laughs> <laughs> In Italian, there's a phrase which means the morsel of shame. 
Languages that have distinct words or phrases by which something that can be categorized are more efficient. How many times have you lost an argument with someone only to think of the perfect response after the argument is over? And that brings to mind uh, Seinfeld with the jerk store, right? Um, in French, there's a word for this, and I'm not going to say it because I don't speak French, but translated literally it means to have the spirit of the staircase. It means to come up with the idea, the ideal retort to an annoying remark after one has left the party and is heading down the stairs. To have staircase wit. After I gave this talk for the first time earlier this year in South Africa, somebody shared this word with me, Kummerspeck, which is a German word um, describing the process or the, or the practice of eating out of sadness. And literally, the word means grief bacon. <laughs> um, not to pick on English too much, English speakers, we, we have this word pattern that we use to describe regularities, either exact or approximate, that we perceive in the world. If you want to talk about something like that in French, you would learn your frustration. There is no French word that covers this very clear zone of conceptual space. Depending on the details and the context of what you mean, you have to choose between one of these French words. And at the outset, this lacuna or gap in the French lexicon seems like a rude violation of common sense. Why wouldn't you have a word for the concept of pattern? Patterns are self-evident and objective. They should be universal to all languages, but that's not the case. If one language has a, a single word or idiom that describes a set of situations that another language uses these words suit to describe, we're dealing with linguistic richness and linguistic poverty. Linguistic poverty constrains how we think about problems. Linguistic richness gives us rich mental shortcuts for solving problems. And spoken and written languages aren't the only languages with lacunae. Um, this is sampling of built-in data types in Ruby. Each type can be considered an analogical mapping or category as it represents a core set of characteristics and behaviors that define a type of thing. There are only six built-in types in JavaScript. And if we overlay the two of them, we see that the languages have two primitives in common in green, object and string. There's overlap with Boolean, um, being true and false in Ruby. Um, and JavaScript has a little bit more richness, a little bit more expressiveness with null and undefined, whereas in Ruby we use nil. But it's clear that Ruby has more categories of things. That means that as Ruby programmers, we can more succinctly categorize and utilize these categories with ease, whereas in JavaScript, with fewer built-in categories, more, more word soup. When we have words for concepts, we can more clearly identify them, communicate about them effectively, and distinguish between them. What do we do when we don't have a word for something? We can invent a new word, but programmers like to say that naming things is hard, so we really don't do that. What we tend to do is borrow a word from um, some other place and start using that instead. And many of the day-to-day -day terms that we use in software development are borrowed from other fields, in particular engineering and design. And reusing existing terms and repurposing them is a form of analogy making. Here's some examples. Scaffolding. Scaffolding helps, is, a, is a physical construction that helps you erect structures quickly and safely. Um, fixtures. This is one I didn't know before I started doing the research for this talk. In testing electronic equipment, such as circuit boards and electronic components and chips, a test fixture is a device or setup designed to hold the device in place and allow it to be tested by being subjected to controlled electrical impulses. Um, we might do a smoke test after we go to production. This comes from plumbing, where um, in a pipe system, they'll force a non-toxic art artificially created smoke through waste and drain pipes under pressure and look for leaks, um, the leaks indicated by plumes of smoke rising from um, any defects in the pipes. We have modules. In industrial design, modularity refers to an engineering technique that's building larger systems composed of smaller subsystems. And in UI, we have wireframes. The term wireframe comes from designers and architects literally using metal wire to represent the three-dimensional shape of objects. My favorite one is scaling. 
This one really surprised me. So that is a pantograph. Um, a pantograph is a mechanical linkage that allows the movement of one pin tracing an image to produce identical movements in a second pin. Um, if a line drawing is traced by the same point, an identical or enlarged or reduced copy can be drawn by a fixed by a pin fixed to the other side. And this process is known as scaling. Um, using the same principle, different kinds of pantographs are used for other forms of duplication, including in sculpture and minting and engraving and milling. So when we talk about scaling a web application, this is actually where that term comes from, which I think is pretty fascinating. The words we use to categorize problems reduce the number of patterns or data points that we need to parse. And problem solving is largely about pattern recognition. So this is easily recognizable as a graph. We have no context, so we don't know what kind of graph it is. The resolution is really high, so there's too much precise data for us to identify any real patterns. But if we zoom out, we lose information, but we gain some perspective. At this point, does anyone recognize what this graph might represent? Audio. It's an audio waveform. We see patterns in it, but we don't have a language to express what those patterns are. So if we zoom in a little bit, the pattern becomes more apparent. There are a series of regularly spaced spikes, where we might guess that the spikes and valleys correspond to high and low peaks in volume. An audio engineer has a vocabulary for describing this pattern. She would know that the peaks correspond to beats, and she would be able to cor correctly guess that the tall spikes correspond to drum hits. An audio engineer is able to look at that graph and see the song. The utility of data comes from our ability to see patterns in it. And we can hold more patterns in active memory if we have names for them. That's why we invent names, why names are so important. There are cognitive shortcuts, there are bookmarks, there are wrappers for complex concepts. The identification of core analogical categories in programming is so important, we've actually created a vocabulary purely dedicated to assisting us with these tasks. And this vocabulary forms a pattern language. And when I say patterns in the context of a gathering like this, you may be forgiven for thinking of the game, Gang of Four. Eric Gamma, Ralph Johnson, Richard Helm, and John Vlasides. Their Design Patterns book was published in 1994, has been reprinted more than 40 times in the past 20 years. It's very influential in our field and has sold more than half a million copies. The book introduced 23 core patterns. Each pattern is an analogical mapping between an unmarked category, such as visitor, and an observation about a solution to a common problem in code. Giving names to these patterns lets us identify them and discuss them with a minimal of confusion and implement them in an efficient manner without the word soup of extraneous code. But the Gang of Four did not invent pattern languages. This is Christopher Alexander. He's an architect noted for his theories about design. He's completed more than 200 building projects around the world. He reasoned that users know more about the buildings that they need than an architect could. So he produced and validated a pattern language designed to empower anyone to design and build at any scale. His book, A Pattern Language, contains 253 patterns, each describing a problem and offering a solution. His patterns form an identifiable field of relationships, and each pattern was reviewed by multiple architects for its beauty and practicality. The very existence of the language that we use to describe common patterns in software development depends on an analogical mapping from a completely unrelated field, architecture. But even Alexander wasn't the first person to try and create a catalog of abstract ideas. This is Gottfried Leibniz. He was a natural philosopher and um, alchemist who strove to create an alphabet of human thought, a universal way to represent and analyze ideas and relationships between ideas by breaking them down into component pieces. The core hypothesis of his thought alphabet is that all complex ideas are compounded from lots of very small, simple ideas, each of which can be represented by a unique character. And his work in this area was pivotal to the development of um, the binary number system and also the thing he's most well known for, which is calculus. We use pattern recognition to identify common problems and we use pattern languages to describe their solutions. The complex systems that we build emerge from combinations of these problem-solution pairs. 
These systems are built on metaphors that are embedded in our pattern languages. Do pattern languages remove the need for individuals to formulate their own metaphors and their own analogical categories? No. We draw on past experiences to categorize new experiences and put them in the context of what we already understand. The more diverse a group of people is, the more different kinds of experiences the group has to draw on. Diversity increases the group's ability to make and draw on analogies. People from different backgrounds have different ways of looking at the world. People who speak different languages have different ways of thinking about a different problem, maybe even being drawn from a vocabulary um, or a word or phrase in their language that we don't have in English. Women have different life experiences from men. People who transition into tech from other careers have a wealth of knowledge from their previous life um, that they can bring to bear. Um, there's a woman named Catherine um, Phillips. She paired up with a woman named um, Katie Lingu uh, Lillenquist, sorry, and Margaret Neal, um, all researchers from Kellogg School, Brigham Young, and Stanford. They, connect, they conducted an experiment with fraternity and sorority members. They divided um, these fraternity and sorority members into groups and presented each group with a murder mystery. Once discussion was underway, the experimenters added someone to each group. In the control group, they added another person from a fraternity or sorority. And in the experimental group, they added someone who's outside of the Greek system altogether. The homogenous groups that were composed entirely of sorority members or entirely of fraternity members felt more confident in their decisions. But the diverse groups, the ones with outsiders injected into them, were more effective, even if the newcomers did not bring new ideas to the group. The study demonstrated that the presence of socially distinct newcomers um, and the social concerns that came along with their presence stimulated members of the group to um, different behaviors, and that those different behaviors led to cognitive gains. The mere presence of diversity in a group created an awkwardness among the core members of the group, and the need to diffuse that tension led to better group problem solving. Regardless of whether we draw on a common language or individual perception, the conceptual categories that we work with can be slippery, leading to ambiguity. But is ambiguity always bad? Um, in my copious free time, um, I'm working on an AI project called Sophia. And um, the fun thing that, that Sophia does is um, my goal with Sophia is to write a program that can understand metaphors and actually create new metaphors. Um, the data modeling is really interesting because um, I need to model core concepts. Um, so I have, um, I have what I call context, for example, disposition, and every context has an expression. So everything here in green is an expression. So um, disposition might be expressed as friendly, or open, or mean, or unkind. And um, branching off of the expressions are grammatical forms, and there's a, a whole big complicated graph. Um, so this is um, a, a subgraph of the context disposition and its expressions. And this is temperature. Um, temperature expresses itself as tropical, or chilly, or warm, or Portland in August. <laughs> um, so astute observers may have noted that there's some crossover. So the words warm and cold, for example, belong to two different contexts. Um, and so Sophia, when she's presented with a sentence with the word warm in it, and she has to figure out what we're talking about, that cat is warm. Warm is ambiguous. There's no way to, for her to tell if, she means, if, the, if the sentence means disposition or temperature. So what she'll do is look at the context around it. That cat is warm. She's been sitting in the hot sun all day. She'll know we're talking about temperature. And an English teacher who at the top of one of my papers wrote, there is no artistry in ambiguity. And I couldn't disagree with her more. Art is about ambiguity. We can use the slipperiness of concepts to form new analogies. A University of Bamberg research team led by psychologist Claudia Muth makes that argument in a paper she published last year. She conducted a study in which participants evaluated paintings. And the study found that the higher the degree of ambiguity within an artwork, the more participants liked it, and the more interesting and affecting it was for them. 
So insights from an artwork can be triggered by its ambiguity. The pleasure that the experimental subjects experienced, interestingly, was not related to their ability to figure out the ambiguity. Um, they looked at each painting, they rated it for like interest and how strongly it affected them. And after their second viewing, they, were rated, it, they rated it on its degree of ambiguity. Um, the higher they assessed a painting's ambiguity, the more they appreciated it. Ambiguity had the highest, largest positive effect on the interest that they expressed in a work of art. A little ambiguity can go a long way, and embracing ambiguity is an essential part of making an analogy. It's leaving out details and focusing on the big picture. The opposite of that is focusing so much on specificity that we fail to make analogies. We find ourselves in that situation unable to solve problems. There's a word for this, it's called functional fixedness, which is a cognitive bias that limits a person using an object or concept only in its traditional use. Carl Dunker coined the term functional fixedness for describing difficulties in visual perception and problem solving arising from the fact that one element of a situation has a fixed purpose or fixed function which has to be changed to make the correct perception or to find the solution to the problem. His most famous experiment was the candle problem. The situation is defined by three objects, a box of thumbtacks, a book of matches, and a candle. The task is to affix the candle to the wall without any additional elements. When given to undergraduates at Stanford, only 23% of students were able to solve the problem. I'm not gonna give you the answer. At the end of the talk, if you can figure out the answer to this question, the answer to this challenge, come up and see me and I will give you a greater than code t-shirt. So think about it. Functional fixedness can be a matter of life and death. The Titanic went down. The Titanic went down as a result of hitting an iceberg. Lots of people went into the water. A few people made it into rowboats. No one considered an iceberg as a kind of flotation device that they could have climbed on top of to save their lives because iceberg was obstacle. Iceberg was the thing that sinks ships. There are ways to overcome functional fixedness. There's this thing called the generic part strategy. For each object, you decouple its function from its form. You break it into parts and you ask yourself two questions. Can I subdivide this further? And if yes, you do so. Um, and you ask yourself, does my current description of this thing imply a use? And if yes, then you create a more generic in, um, description um, referring only to shape and material. This strips away the layers of associated uses from an object and its parts. People who are trained in the technique of generic parts are able to solve 67% more, more problems that suffer from functional fixedness. Um, if you've seen Apollo 13, which is a great movie, overcoming functional fixedness saved the astronauts on Apollo 13 from death. They had multiple system failures, including their CO2 scrubbers. Um, engineers on the ground had to use only materials available to the astronauts to construct a device that, con that converted square filters on their CO2 scrubbers to circular filter attachments in the lander. They used things like the binding for a manual as a raw material to help them solve the problem. <clears throat> when we first approach a new idea or a situation or an area of investigation, the impressions that we form are shallow. You might say we're, we're, we focus on marked categories. Novices notice surface features because they only understand the marked categories. They lack the complete understanding that comes with having abstracted deep features into unmarked categories. For an expert in the domain, deep features are not elusive or hidden, they are the most salient features. Expertise involves creating, internalizing, and drawing on a rich vocabulary of analogical categories. A 1997 study of meetings of a molecular biology lab found that the majority of analogies used by scientists were based on deep structural features between problems and not surface level features. So, the accumulation of new and novel analogical categories is the mechanism by which expertise is acquired and it's the mechanism by which fields of study advance. Over time, each area of human study acquires more analogical categories and is able to map between concepts with greater ease. 
This doesn't mean that a scientist in 2016 is smarter than a scientist in 1716. The conceptual leaps that are made in the formative time of the formative period of a field of study are essential um, and just as innovative as the combinatorial leaps that um, happen in a more established field of study. Every established analogy that a scientist makes or a researcher makes is like a baton that a climber uses to make the ascent of those who come after a little easier. I mentioned at the beginning that analogies help us deal with novel situations. It's easy to think of examples of architects and painters and scientists who, thanks to a fresh analogy, transported a concept from one domain to a distant one to great effect. The making of analogies is a cognitive activity that some people have a real gift for. It happens when a mind dares to explore unlikely connections between concepts and reveals relationships between things that were not previously thought of as related. As programmers, we often come up with a label for a complex situation by finding a concrete situation to which it is analogically mapped. And we borrow the standard name of that concrete situation and apply it to our new concept. This allows us to create a useful verbal label, label for a new category of situations. In most of my talks, I pick on Dijkstra. Dijkstra said, it is the most common way of trying to cope with novelty by means of metaphors and analogies we try to link the new to the old, the novel to the familiar. Coping with radical novelty, however, requires an orthogonal method. One has to approach the radical novelty with a blank mind, consciously refusing to try and link it to what is already familiar, because the familiar is hopelessly inadequate. Coming to grips with the radical novelty amounts to creating and learning a new foreign tongue that cannot be translated. Douglas Hofstadter in his book counters this by saying, thanks to categorization through analogy making, we have the ability to spot similarities and exploit these similarities to deal with the new and with the strange. Perhaps Nietzsche said it best when he defined truth as a mobile army of metaphors. So we've talked a lot about categories, and we'd be remiss if we didn't at least touch on category theory. Category theory is essentially the study of structure. It's the study of things, and the mapping between these things, translating objects into other objects. The main draw of category theory is the ability to connect otherwise disparate fields. It's a skeleton to hang other knowledge on. In category theory, you throw away details to reveal a structure of objects. The two main concepts in category theory are objects and morphisms. Objects can be thought of as sets and arrows as functions. Categories are simply collections of objects, like application and user. Every object in category theory has an identity function. When called, it returns the definition of the object. This is similar to executing the marked category. Consider what happens when we have a user object called user1. If we simply call the name of our variable, we get the identity, we get the associated object back. That's an invocation of the identity method. Morphisms tie two objects together, a source object and a target object. So to string is a morphism. We're able to say user one to string. We're performing a morphism on a member of a category. In Ruby, um, we commonly use functions with divergent return values because we are a weakly typed language, an untyped language. Um, and when we have divergent um, return values, such as using nil for false, makes it harder to reason about program logic. It also leads to situations where you have to switch on type. And in a dynamic language, we can even invoke functions that don't exist. We can try to perform a morphism that hasn't been defined. And that leads to an exception being raised, which is the break in control flow. Exceptions, in addition to the problems they raise for us as programmers, violate fundamental pr principles of category theory. But as Rails developers, we can define a function on any object to replace that exception using method missing, which is evil. Method missing allows us to maintain control flow, which is good, but it comes to the price of a higher cognitive overload, performance impact, and it's really difficult to reason about. When we expect one kind of return type and chain methods together, bad things can happen when we can't predict what the return type of a method call is gonna be. Um, if we have a user and a user has a property name, but name is not necessarily defined, for members A and B of application user, there's a name, 
So we're able to get D and E, which are strings, and we, we can then call upcase from that result and get G and H, which are strings. But for a user for whom a name is not defined, we, call up, we get a nil, and we call upcase, and we get an exception. So what if we do this instead? This is interesting. This is the safe navigator, or as it is sometimes known in a very, I think, a very cute way of calling it, is the lonely operator. Um, it's a game changer. It breaks, uh, it replaces the break in control flow by swapping an unknown method for an identity method. There's a great video series on category theory by a guy named Bartos Maluski. One of the points he makes is that traditionally in science, we've approached problems, and this is true in software development too, we approach big problems by breaking them down into a series of small problems, solving the small problems, and composing the large, pro uh, the large solution out of the small solutions. For centuries, we've been, scientists have been breaking down complex situations into their component parts, working toward a set of platonic ideals to describe the makeup of the universe. And that's pretty much the, the philosophy of um, programming languages and scripting languages and Unix itself. But there are places where that strategy isn't effective. Object-oriented programming brought in abstractions that let us reason about larger pieces and functional programming brings us closer to the ideal of applying category theory to software practices. The evolution of programming is moving toward larger abstractions, not smaller units of understanding. The emergence of string theory and set theory and category theory, we're starting to understand that it's through abstraction that we can derive the most meaning about the world we live in. Abstraction is proving to be the key to understanding reality. The very creation of a class is a form of categorization, and defining methods on a class is defining morphisms on a category. Categories are at the heart of object-oriented programming. And when we define a class, we're creating an analogical mapping. Um, outside of the realm of, of, uh, of software development, um, analogical mappings and category theory have some interesting um, results. Um, observing waves in water, early scientists were able to create a formula to express the frequency of a wave returning its period. So we have a category A of waves and the amorphism frequency which results in a period. But abstracting the notion of a wave, moving away from the marked category of wave as movement of water to a more general unmarked category of wave two led to a really important innovation. In about 240 BC, the Greek philosopher Chrysippus speculated that sound was a kind of wave. And 200 years later, the Roman architect Vitruvius explicitly link, uh, linked the spreading of sound waves to a source from the circular spreading of ripples on water. By simply asking, what if X is a wave, we can perform analogical mappings to gain insight and knowledge. For example, if we consider mood as a wave and we map it in a graph, we can determine the frequency of depressive episodes and predict when they will occur. The foundation of analogical mapping is asking what if X is a Y2. It's the mechanism behind a lot of innovations across the breadth of human enterprise. Categorization means ignoring unnecessary details. And when we do that, different things suddenly become identical or related. Sound and water become related in that they both move in waves. Samantha and Roger become related by both being users in our system. This is epistemology versus ontology. It's how we reason about things versus what things are. So to bring it back, who are we really? We are curious people. We are natural philosophers. We're the masters of analogies. We're elegant machines that turn sensory input into categories and metaphors. We recognize ideals and particulars the taxonomy of concepts, and the interrelatedness of all things. We create systems for classifying every conceivable thing in the universe. And in the end, when we gain an understanding of these complex systems and models, we expose and exploit connections to uncover and manipulate new knowledge. This is a picture of my personal copy of an alchemical text called The Divine Pymander. Um, it was first translated from Latin to English in 1650. It contains 17 tracks exploring concepts such as creativity, chaos and order, manifestation, the nature of God, and monads. <laughs> um, 
monads in the, in the sense, in the alchemical sense, is a word for the primacy of essence. At the end of the book, there is this passage. The image shall become thy guide because sight hath this peculiar charm. It holdeth fast and draweth unto it those who succeed in opening their eyes. To translate that into the vocabulary of 2017, we might say, metaphors will guide us. Ideas persist and draw us closer, bidding us to recognize them. Software development is an inquiry into the nature of reality. It's a reflection of a worldview. It's a worldview made concrete in code. We study ideal objects and we bring them into existence as a network of interrelated instances. And we manipulate their interactions and their relationships to change the fundamental nature of the world. As software developers, we borrow metaphors and analogies from more well-defined disciplines, in particular engineering and architecture and science. But why should we limit our problem-solving vocabularies and our metaphors to the disciplines that we worship so devoutly, when the corridors of human knowledge are so vast. We should cast our nets wide. We should step outside of our self-imposed categories of thought. We should read everything, broaden our interests, look for metaphors and concepts and analogies that we can apply to our arts and our science. We should use our powers of categorization and analogy making to create breakthroughs, to advance ourselves and advance our field in new and unexpected directions. We should be geniuses. We should be innovators. That's what our minds were designed to do. And that's what we were born to be. Thank you. So, thumbtacks, candles, matches, who has an answer? First person who makes it up here and tells me the correct answer. <laughs> you don't get to do it. You're too close. <laughs> you end. All right, what's the answer? Uh, dump out the thumbtacks, use them to attach the box to the wall, put the candle in the box. Yes. Dump out the thumbtacks, <laughs> use the thumbtacks to attach the box to the wall, put the candle on the box of thumbtacks. Um, interestingly, um, if... Um, if during the expression of the problem, uh, you get a graded in code t-shirt, see, um, see Sam. Um, if, if during the description of the problem, the box was empty and the thumbtacks were in a pile, 67% more people got the correct answer. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, okay, that's it for me. Um, I asked my friend Aaron one day, um, I was at a conference, I think it was RubyConf a few years ago, and somebody tweeted, oh my god, I saw Coraline in the hallway, but I was afraid to go up and say hi. And this broke my heart, because like, I'm nice, and I don't yell at people, and I like meeting new people. So I talked to Aaron Patterson. I was like, Aaron, does this happen to you, and what do you do about it? He's like, yes, it happens to me. I have stickers. So <laughs> I made custom Code Witch stickers with adorable 8-bit artwork of me wearing a witch hat. And I would love for everyone to come up here and get one of my code, code Rich stickers and introduce yourselves. I also have a small number of Greater Than Code stickers. If you don't know what Greater Than Code is, it is only the best tech podcast in the world. Um, <laughs> brief bit of history. There's this podcast that was called Ruby Rogues. One day all the panelists quit and said, fuck it, let's do our own podcast. Thus, Greater Than Code was born. Um, so we have Greater Than Code um, stickers. We have other t-shirts. So you get your first pick of the size. We have one of each size. So go see Sam, and maybe you'll get lucky with the with t-shirt the, uh, size. But first, come get stickers for me. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>